See now because I feel like I'm repeating myself. But um, I work at a company called Tello. It uh, started in 1999, Providence, Rhode Island, out of RISD and Brown, and then we expanded to San Francisco and then to Amsterdam. And all the projects that we do connect physical objects and architecture to the web or through networks to other objects, um, ranging from medical simulation to uh, crazy marketing stunts to museum exhibitions. And it's 13 years of projects, so I'm just going to talk about one for 10 minutes or something like that. And what I'd rather do is that you just interrupt me when you have a question about something and we just chat about it and we run up until 30 minutes instead of me trying to race to some deadline and then everyone's standing there and me having to pick on people to ask questions. So just please stop me when something's interesting. Um, these are some of the kinds of clients we work for. Uh, everything ranging from very producty, human-centered design research, big data, mobile device, and some stuff to games for Disney, uh, to elevators that are filled with touch screens uh, for Otis and future of elevators, to all kinds of strange stuff like that. Um, like I was saying to people before, we do a lot of gaming, especially in the health gaming space, encouraging people to be more physically active through online play, through sensors, pedometers, scales, blood pressure cuffs, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk just about associative play and this kind of recent ex collaboration, collaborative exhibition with the side, I think is more funny. Um, these words might help you to understand what we do. We don't use these words ourselves, but we understand that they're very good handles for McKinsey and Business Week and people just outside of our domain uh, to understand a bit about what we do. Um, to sum it up, basically, we don't think we, as much as we do design things that are both hardware and software, we don't think about them as in layers. We think that the networks and data are as much a part of the form of the physical things that we make as their physical shape is, as their three dimensional shape is. And they, we aim always to synthesize those things to the point where they, you can't imagine them being apart, that they just feel naturally kind of made that way. And hopefully some of the things I show you will feel a bit like that. We, this is the best we've done for ourselves and trying to achieve that, try to describe how. Uh, uh, all right, I almost skipped this, but it's worth telling. This is my dog, Bruno. He's German short hair pointer. He's about seven years old. And I just put this slide in here because it reminds me about why I think, why what's most amazing about computers for me, how computing feels great to me. Um, a couple of months ago, he went missing. He lives with my family in Connecticut, and uh, he had heard some gunshots on the hill, which isn't uncommon for this kind of backwater town. He ran off, didn't come back overnight. My uncle's freaking out, calling me every hour. And finally, this woman calls me, and I'm on a tram in Amsterdam at midnight, and she says that she's the local dog catcher from Plainfield, Connecticut, and she has Bruno. And I'm 3,000 miles away from her. She has a pickup truck and a barn. It's not like some high-tech research hospital or something. And um, turns out that she had the mental model to think of this dog as an interface and wave a wand over him and find the RFID chip that was embedded in his shoulder blade when he was a tiny puppy, which I had totally forgotten I said yes to even having done. Because when he was getting his first shots or vaccinations, they said, oh, just let's let us do it. It's better for the dog. And she found my old phone number, called the post office, found my new address, found my Dutch phone number, figured out how to dial the Dutch country code, called me, six hour time difference, I called home, and he was home in 20 minutes later. The idea that this dog is a, has the visible affordances of being a networked, near field <laughs> communication interface is fascinating to me, because uh, he's also just a really great companion, and it's, yeah. So it's not just about connecting things to the web, that's hard to do well, it's kind of plumbing and infrastructure, but it can be done creatively. What we find is as important is figuring out what these things should say. If you have sensors talking to the web, or you have the web controlling actuators at a bus stop, we can talk, we've been talking for a decade about how cool that is to do. There's very few examples of aha moments of that's what they should say. And 
we don't claim to have solved that, but we strive towards uh, answering that for ourselves. This makes much more sense when it has audio, so I'm not going to play it, I'll just describe, describe it. Um, about a year and a half ago, Google Creative Lab and Google Chrome Marketing came to us and said, we want to market the Chrome browser. We're building all these experiments that show off how awesome Chrome is and the power of the modern web and just how amazing the modern web is. And we've seen the kinds of stuff Teller does, what would, what would you do? And they gave us a few weeks to go off and sketch and build some working prototypes. So we started thinking, oh, we'll, Chrome is great because it's so fast, so we'll teach the science of speed, so we'll teach physics with this web-controlled marble run where people will be able to come and control bridges and ramps and learn about velocity and friction and elasticity and all these things. But and they, so they let us build some prototypes, and then after about a month of doing that, we realized, why are we teaching physics when we could be just teaching how the web works? It's amazing, and most people take it, including ourselves, take it for granted these days. We don't remember how awesome it is that when we send an email to New York, it goes under the Atlantic Ocean, and that it only takes on the order of milliseconds to get there. And the reason why it takes any time at all is because it's pushing through physical material, like glass or copper. That's seriously amazing stuff. So we thought, why don't we make a science museum exhibition that has five groups of experiments. Each one will teach about a different principle of how the web works. Compression and streaming, languages and protocols, transmission media, stuff like that. And each one will be very physical so that we can kind of embody the otherwise invisible, intangible stuff of the web in some physical thing. But we also want to have, Google wanted to have a huge audience because that's what they do. So it's hard to have millions of people control a finite number of things. They're spoiled. They're used to being able to just throw servers at stuff and have more parallel users to infinity, basically. And so we, they let us make some prototypes. And one of the first things we made well, we came up with this phrase, inspired by the magic of the modern web, to kind of remind us that we're not teaching in the didactic sense, we're not training people to be go off and write software. We just want kids and, and people of all ages to come there, both online and in the physical museum, and leave there with a sense that they could learn more about computer science, and that it is cool and interesting and actually amazing, and, um, and that's good for everyone. And Google had a commitment to funding education from a philanthropic part of their business and they were sponsoring science museums and building all kinds of educational stuff. But it also would show off how amazing Chrome is, so it's also a marketing thing. It also became this really great thing for the museum because they um, they never had an audience that came more than a few times a generation or any kind of museum. You come bring your kids there and then your kids bring their kids there or something. But the idea that people would come to a museum and then go home and continue their experience or that they would visit it from across the earth in the middle of the night while the museum's closed and make stuff there wasn't really something that they were doing a lot of. There were some cool projects that existed before, but we tried to bring that to another level. And so that's what we did. We, um, we made this little film in a weekend and it was to communicate this idea of the five little exhibits and we went back to the Chrome team and said, uh, what do you think? And they said, well, if you can find a good museum to host this, we'll fund it and, you know, you'll have to keep it within some reason, but we'll, we'll sponsor it. So we brought this little movie to, it's all stop frame animation made out of paper with exacto knives and little CNC plotters. And um, we brought it to the London Science, Museum of Science and they said, that's great, that's exactly what we want to do. Here's 550 square meters, and you can have it for 12 months in like prime real estate in the middle of the museum, if Google will sponsor the exhibition, just the making of it. And the museum even put in some of their own resources to do the demolition and, and hire the people to be interpreters, and they were just amazing, dig up the streets to lay fiber and all that stuff. And, um, and Google said, great, because it was their London office of Chrome that was really doing this, but then it spread to Mountain View and so on. But the museum in London is a very special museum and it has a lot of amazing traffic and it was right before the Olympics, so it was, it was really a good venue for this. So the point of this is that it really was a prototype. We actually evolved the concept while making this film and maybe it was the friction of working in stop frame or paper or whatever that slowed us down enough to think, well, actually, wouldn't it be a lot easier if we just remove this step and users could just do this bit or that bit? 
and um, or maybe we shouldn't do a huge 64 head industrial embroidery machine because threads break every five minutes and we'd have to staff this thing with trained experts for 12 months uh, and instead we should find some other medium and so we did and um, so then we started building real prototypes this is just an example of some of the robots that we were building we use computer vision I'll show you some of the ones that are finished with very little time I'm sorry if I'm racing but intro one of the uh, exhibits was to show how distance had become meaningless with the web being so fast. So you could look out real, almost real time, 360 cameras and pan around in a very far away place through these binoculars, like you're in a tourist resort, but you're looking out cameras in a shark tank in South Africa, or you're looking into a bakery in North Carolina that's open 24 hours a day, things like that just as an example. We installed those in the Boston Museum of Science for a month, and we, uh, a little less than a month, and we interviewed people, and we observed users, and we changed the ideas, and we did several times involved them with some prototyping. Then we shipped everything. We built it all in Providence, most of it. We shipped it, filling an airplane to London. That's one musical instrument out of eight, and that's just one of the groups, of five groups of experiments. So we filled that truck. Um, we lived in the basement of the museum for about two months, about ten of us from Telart, plus this was the point where when we came, Telart developed the whole concept with Creative Lab, and then we got it to a 60-page screenplay of user interactions, both online and in the space, and drawings of what everything would look like and how it would work, and then um, it, the scope grew so much, and people at Google got so excited they wanted it to be more throughput and open 24 hours a day and all this stuff. So we hired uh, Be Real, this amazing company that does branding and some web stuff, to join us. And they were incredible and made made it much better than we could have. And then UDA, Universal Design Studio did the architecture, like wall treatments and floors and flow patterns. And they were amazing. So we all lived in this basement for a while. It looked like this. There's like, at times, 30 plus union British dudes pulling cable and having lunch breaks it was pretty amazing. But to get to the actual groups of experiments, this is what it looks like when you come in. Um, that's a marimba. I'll, I'll show you when I talk about the music part. So there's five experiments. It's an orchestra where people play music in uh, collaboratively. So the teleporter is the binocular one I was talking about. Sketchbox draws your portrait in sand. Data tracer shows you where packets travel through the web across the earth. And the explorer is the first one I'll tell you about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, kind of a short answer is there were a few drivers. One was the internet telecommunications learning outcomes for the UK. So we kind of talked to some science teachers and some subject matter experts to figure out how to break down the information into memorable modules. Um, part of it was driven by what would create a spectacular experience in the museum, just as sculpture essentially, because it's attracting people, getting them to engage with it is the first step of any good information design. And um, clarity is important, but it actually has to come after you get convinced people that it's relevant or interesting. And um, part of it was driven by what um, technology, what web technologies will best show off the, the power of Chrome. So JavaScript, WebGL, real-time uh, engine, app engine stuff, and I'll, I'll show you some of those. There are a lot of different drivers, and it's a whole other conversation. We can talk more about it later. Did you also think about uh, certain parts of the web technology, like uh, the web more out of the content and the prototypes and it's a great question I'll try to answer it through the experiments because one of the things is like any project has its 
own weird array of constraints. The, one of the like maintenance and cost and materials and environmental impact and all that stuff, one of the big ones with this one was privacy. Because privacy law. So you've got hundreds of thousands of kids in the museum away from their parents with teacher guardians and 50 live cameras streaming to the web with people interacting with them through machines and there's choking hazards and fire hazards and all kinds of crazy stuff but there's also why you know because of crazy not crazy sorry uh, esoteric laws about divorced parents in the UK not being able to show kids faces over cameras because they would know where they were and it's shocking but super interesting and we ended up bringing the lawyers onto the design team and getting them to teach us as much as they possibly could about privacy law so that we could turn that to our advantage and sculpt the things to take best advantage of it. So this one, for instance, like music does that because it's nonverbal communication. The robots do that because people don't type in messages that encourages people to write shit and other stuff. They just uh, use images that use pattern face recognition so we know it's a face and lots of things like that. So yes, this one, we wanted to have a personalized experience where people could keep the stuff that they made, but we couldn't ask kids to sign up for Google Plus or give us their email address, and didn't want to do that with anyone, frankly. So we came up with this tag system, these little, little plastic cards, kind of like these things, nice thick plastic things. Each one of them has a different human readable, or we call it kind of hieroglyphic pattern. As, as much as I can tell mine is different than yours and things like that, there's a trillion variations of these things. It's based on the branding that we came up with, or with, with uh, Be Real came up with. Then the pattern around the outside, we worked with Carson Schmidt. That's, those are actually digits, so each one of those makes each of those cards different to computer vision. So you go into the museum, you get one dispensed, you go to the music instrument, you stick it in like my little friend Herbie is doing here, plays music for a couple of minutes collaboratively with someone who's in Hong Kong. A clip of that music gets uploaded to YouTube. He goes home, goes to chromelablab.com, shows that card to his camera, and it brings up all the stuff he made while he was at the museum. So it's an anonymous way of authenticating, but it's also this cool token that kids love, and little do they know if they trade them, they go home and get their friend's stuff. It's, it's funny, and uh, it, we turned it to the advantage in the sense that this is another branding touch point for the exhibition, kids love the token, and uh, it, it gave us an avatar symbol for every user so we could use it to communicate or to, as a platform to encourage a sense of social presence between people who are in the museum, like being able to see that they were playing with someone online, that symbol now represented that person that was online. Is that, that's kind of an example. Privacy is one of the main it's one example. Privacy, people have people are just naughty. People will write awful stuff and draw awful stuff if you let them draw and submit drawings. And even if you ask someone to draw something, we were talking about this earlier, you ask someone to, what do you want to make a 3D model of? I'll model it for you. They don't, a lot of people will be stunned and not know exactly what they want to make. And if you give them just some options, like choose one of these photos and we'll show you where it came from. They'll choose between the butterfly or the, you know, whatever, the other yellow thing. So this one, uh, so to show that in action, we took those symbols in this wall. Actually, um, they're flooding down this ramp, and those are actually people logging into the website in real time. And each of those symbols represents someone online. And then this robot that we made draws in dry erasing. Uh, the shape of Australia and some of the patterns will cluster inside and then it'll write 126 people in Australia are currently in the web lab. Then erase it and draw a musical instrument and say this many people are currently playing music in the web lab online. And it's your first thing that you see and it just reinforces for, or just tells you for a first time these are the people you're collaborating with who are out there. It's, it's kind of an embodiment of that. And it also is a, to answer your question further, it's an example of we couldn't use paper because we've already had 2.5 million people to make drawings. And so that paper would fill this room in just rooms or this room. And so dry erasing and a custom robot became the right solution. Or drawing in sand or other things like that. 
Um, this stuff's online, you can experience it if you go to Chrome Web Lab, so I won't spend too much time on it. These are more visualizations of where your collaborators come from, and it really uses WebGL and a lot of nice demanding web technologies. Um, data Tracer. This one is the one I was talking about where you get to see where images come from on the web. So you go up to one of these six, I think, four uh, touch screens, and you get a bunch of images of things that are, let's say, yellow. And you say, I don't know, sunflower. You throw it, and it goes, well, actually, let me just show you. I'll show you a web version of the visualization. This is the WebGL mesh we based, built based on NASA topography data. It's a small CNC model. This is a 10 meter wall sized three dimensional map that we made using that same WebGL mesh. And uh, we would project on top of it the actual trace routes. Again, trying to synthesize the, the virtual and the physical. That physical map is the only map in this visualization, and the virtual lines are going over those contours and they're inseparable. Simple example. This is one um, searching for an image, and it goes out, finds it, goes back to London, and tells you how many milliseconds it goes under the Atlantic there, comes up in Switzerland, goes back up to London, and it tells you how many times faster the bullet train that packet traveled. Over. And next to this, there's another whole TV that's explaining how packets uh, switching works and moves through the network to create better traffic flows and stuff like that. So that's what it looks like. That's not, that's not CAD, that's the real thing. The robots, um, this one is uh, about languages and protocols, but long story short, you go up to a photo booth like thing, it takes your picture, and the robot draws it in sand. But in the meantime, it also teaches you about how images are uh, bitmaps and we create adaptive thresholds. I'll just show you. We built the robots from scratch. All this aluminum was built in our shops. It's like Italian bicycle tubing. We got to work with this fixie shop to paint them these great lacquer colors. We built all our own rotary encoders and circuits, and that's inside of one. And, and this is, what are we doing on time? Uh, five minutes, six minutes. Left to the end yes. until I have to finish. To the end, end. All right, I'm going to go longer if you keep, it, if you keep asking questions. <laughs> this is, um, so it uses face detection, so somebody can't just hold up nasty stuff. Although you'd be surprised what people can do right on their foreheads. Um, <laughs> and uh, it creates a threshold, it creates vector paths around it, so it shows how it makes points. No, no, that's a good. It's a good question. It actually is a robot with a kind of pin stylus on it. We worked for a long time. We went through maybe 50 different kinds of sand. And we got down to like reptile cage sand and Parisian metal casting sand because of the shape of and size of the granules and how well they stacked up in V-cut letters with different fonts. And um, yeah, you get to see it a bit more. Actually, uh, I don't have that video. You can check it out online and have your own drawing. And uh, draws all the paths and does all that stuff. Then when you go home, or if you're online in a few minutes, a video of that's uploaded to the web. This is stock video footage. This is stock. But then there's three or four other clips in the middle of this, like this. It's coming from three HD live cameras that are actually, so this is my face. It's not stock footage of the robot just moving. And this kind of overlay is another stock graphic. All of these three cameras would go to a half a dozen computers in the lab. Like this is stock footage, but the drawing is. And we wrote a render farm that goes with After Effects that actually does all the editing and compositing and compression and stream and uploading to YouTube all like thousands of drawings a day um, in the lab. It's a picture of me. It's harder than it seems to draw in sand, it turns out. But again, no environment, very low environmental impact, electricity, um, but no paper, no ink, or nothing. 
that's why we chose sand. Not because, of course, it's romantic to think about drawing with a stick on the beach or something. It's also nice, but that's not why initially. The orchestra, you play music with people. It's a way to collaborate and communicate non-verbally. And so um, we built all these instruments by taking orchestra-grade instruments tearing them out of their original housings, building this custom furniture for them with Universal Design Studio, and um, this marimba here. And uh, they're in these frames. Again, it's driven by a constraint of we need three cameras to be able to see the pedals. But you couldn't do that if it was in its original horizontal marimba case that a musician would use. It's also got two mics per thing, and all of that moves to, so everything's getting recorded and goes to this one hub on the ceiling that is like a Pro Tools rack that mixes it down into a studio grade mix down recording and streams it online and that's what everyone's hearing. This is the back of the marimba. Another example of how the form evolved from the functionality is this one, you drag your notes, but that gummy, stretchy snapping is actually a visualization of the latency that happens between when you're online you drag your note to a new position in the loop, that goes out to the actuator, and those video frames come back to you, and even if it's less than a second, it's a visualization of that latency. So when it finally snaps over, you see the hammer hit the note. And otherwise, it feels like it's busted, and it feels like it's slow. Here, we use it as an opportunity to teach about latency. So, teleporter, this one, it's just kind of a one-liner. It's, we had servo cameras like this where one person could look somewhere out in the world, but when you have tens of thousands of people simultaneously using these things, it meant that we had to design and build these custom cameras that recorded whole spheres of HD video and streamed them. Which streaming that alone is kind of a trick, but they own YouTube, so that's good. And, uh, and um, one of them's in a shark tank in South Africa. One I said is in a bakery in uh, North Carolina. The other one's in this miniature city in Germany. That's what the cameras look like. This is a diver installing it in the Shark Tank in South Africa. This is what the video looks like when it comes in. We're streaming it in, unwrapping it, and then attaching it to the interface of those custom-made periscopes. Uh, very quick. And so. This is, this is what it looks like for the people inside. You can also press a thumb button and take snapshots of things if you like. It goes up onto these big gallery walls of tablets in the museum. And lastly, there's just a lot of infrastructure and we have to maintain this thing from around the world. So in Providence, Rhode Island, we have this like mission control. These are the instruments. So anyway, we can see them from cameras and direct people to fix them. Yeah. that we're open sourcing all of this stuff at the end of the month. All the web code, all the machine code, all the SolidWorks, all the Gerber PCB files, all neatly tied up into libraries that are modular and accessible. So watch out for that. And thanks to Google for being brave.